Hello everyone and how is life with you? I hope that all is well with you and that you have a nice day. Welcome to our 15th poetry lecture. If you still remember, our 14th lecture was about the first type of objective poetry, uh, which is the epic. Today we will uh, move and talk about another type of objective poetry, which is known as the ballad. Now let us first start by talking about the beginnings of the ballad and the early history of this um, poetic form. Actually, the ballad is similar to the epic uh, in the sense that the ballad arises out of folk literature. It is classified as folk literature. And um, I think you know that it's one of the oldest forms in English. It's even older than the great poet Chaucer. And is one of the few that are of native growth. Now, what is the origin of the, of the ballad? Actually, the ballad is part of what we might call the oral tradition in literature, where uh, it was sung from village to village and often to the accompaniment of a musical instrument, basically a harp or a fiddle, by a strolling singer or bands of singers who earned a living in this way. So they moved from one tribe to another tribe singing these, these ballads in a time where people had no means of entertainment. Now, what do we call the poet who uh, sang the ballads? If you still remember, in the Anglo-Saxon times, the poet who used to sing his poems was known as the, the shop. But uh, the, uh, the poet of the ballad is known as the minstrel. And um, the significance of, of entertainment during this period of time can be best um, explained if we know that the minstrel was often given a prominent uh, place uh, in order to be seen by listeners. So he usually sang in the chimney corner of a farmhouse or on the village green where a knot of eager listeners were, uh, uh, were uh, assembling. Okay, so this is the beginning of the, of the ballad. Uh, if we want to go back to the etymology of the word ballad, it means a dancing song. And uh, since it is part of the oral tradition, uh, the ballad was passed from one generation to another generation or locality, uh, making its own uh, alternations to suit contemporary or local conditions. And I think this is the reason behind having different versions of the same of the same ballad, depending on whether the tribe uh, has full knowledge of the of the song or partial knowledge. If they have partial, they need a detailed kind of ballad. If it's really complete knowledge, they don't need a detailed ballad. And this probably explains why, if any of you, dear students, tries to Google a famous ballad, he or she is likely to find more than one uh, version of, of, the same, of the same ballad. Um, I tried this with Sir Patrick Spence and I tried this with the Demon Lover and I found that they have different uh, versions. Uh, when we took the epic, uh, one of the important things we did is to talk about characteristics. And today we will, we will do the same with the, with the ballad. I think we ne need to know how the ballad is different from uh, other uh, literary forms. Actually, it has its own identity and its own uh, disting uh, distinguishing features. So let us start. And I want to refer you to page 99 of our book. Page 99 of our book. Um, the first um, thing we have to know is that one of the simplest definitions of the ballad is a short story in verse. 
originally intended to be sung to an audience. Now, the fact that it is like a short story implies uh, necessarily that it has all the elements of the short story. It has a plot, characters, um, setting, uh, and theme. And any other char characteristic you can think of. Uh, since the ballad developed at an early stage in man's cultural evolution, its subjects are deeds rather than thoughts. And this is exactly what we find in all types of objective, of objective uh, poetry. So the topic that we're likely to find in a ballad is not going to be an expression of feelings or emotions. It is likely to be uh, a memorable feud, a thrilling adventure, a family disaster, uh, love and war, and the like. The, uh, the tale in the ballad is usually fierce and tragic and frequently introduces the supernatural. So um, uh, I think we, we don't find ballads that uh, have ha a happy ending. Uh, all ballads have a tragic or a sad, a sad end. Okay, now let us start with the first distinguishing feature. Number one, the, uh, the ballad uses what we call the ballad measure. I think you still remember when we studied stanzaic forms, one important stanzaic form was um, the ballad stanza. The ballad stanza is actually a stanza of four lines. So it's really a quatrain. And usually we find that the first line and the third line uh, are longer than the second line and the fourth line. And also we notice that the second line and the fourth line uh, rhyme together, whereas the first and the third line do not rhyme, do not rhyme together. Uh, uh, what about meter? The first line and the third line are four foot iambic. That is a short syllable followed by a long syllable. And the second and the fourth are three foot iambic. All right. And I think you still remember the, uh, the, ballad, uh, the ballad stanza. All right. Now, the second characteristic is The tale often opens abruptly without, without any systematic introduction. So we notice, for example, that uh, in the quote that we have here, Oh, where have you been? And this is uh, page 100. Oh, where have you been, my long lost love? This long, seven years and more. Uh, I'm come again to say, seek your love and the vows that you did swear. So this is an example of uh, a ballad where the, uh, the ballad poet starts abruptly without any systematic introductions. Um, so you have to understand that number B, which is not, I think, very clear in my slide. Uh, sorry for that. But I think this is uh, page 100, characteristic number B. Um, the tale opens abruptly without any systematic introduction. Sometimes it begins with uh, a question and answer, which do not state who the speaker, um, who the speakers are but make the situation quite clear. Um, I told you that the ballad is a, a short story and often short stories have well-structured plots, but uh, ballads are different, even though they have plots, but the plots do not have systematic introductions. This is exactly what we call uh, exposition in short stories. In short stories proper, usually we have uh, an exposition or an introductory part that acquaints us 
with the events that eventually happened before the actual beginning of the story. But the ballad is really different. The ballad starts suddenly, abruptly, without any introductions. And I think this is uh, uh, partially uh, related to the fact that most of the listeners knew the details of the of the story. So they don't need to have uh, a systematic introduction or a detail, uh, a detailed description of time and place. Okay, so this is number two. Uh, number three, it's impersonal in treatment. Impersonal in treatment. With nothing to show the writer's identity or personality. Um, part of the characteristics of the ballad is that they are impersonal in the way they treat the topic. And why is that? Remember, again and again, the ballad is an objective form of, of poetry. So there is no need for personal treatment. Personal treatment occurs only when we deal with subjective types of uh, poetic uh, modes. We don't need to know the identity or the personality of the of the speaker. It is as though the tale told itself. Even we need to know that the epic sometimes has personal touches, like for example, Paradise Lost. If it had been written by someone uh, else, I mean not by uh, John Milton, I think it would have been a different, a different uh, epic. But but the ballad never. The ballad will not have any uh, personal touches. All right. So this is characteristic number three. Now we will move to characteristic number number four. Uh, ballads actually employ refrains and stock phrases. Refrains and stock phrases. That is um, a repetition of certain words, phrases, uh, lines, or a group of sentences. This is exactly what we call the refrain. So a part of the tradition of writing a ballad is to provide what we call a refrain or an incremental repetition. Now we come to the use of stock phrases. I think before we had the, the Corona uh, crisis, we spoke a lot about stock uh, uh, phrases. And basically, I told you that stock means old, belongs to the old times. A stock theme is a theme that has been employed in literature so many times. A stock character is, uh, uh, is uh, a stereotypical character. Stock phrases are similar in meaning. Stock phrases are phrases which are repeated over and over. And I think this is a great thing to notice in ballads. Ballads express um, the, same, uh, the, the same idea in the same way. That is, if they want to say something, all ballads composers often use the same phrases. And that's why we call them stock phrases. Um, can I um, uh, here uh, refer you to, to uh, page... 101 yes 101 i can uh, i can uh, refer to uh, a number of examples when they um uh, oh they rode on sorry before we go to 101 uh, let, let us uh, read what we have here uh, on the slide which is 100 page 100 oh they rode on and on they rode, and all by the light of the moon, until they came to the wan water, and they lighted down. Oh, they rode on, and on they rode. 
and all by the light of the moon until they came to his mother's hall and there they lighted down. So here we notice the use of the refrain, which is, oh, they rode on and on they, they rode. But I want to give you, before I uh, move to another characteristic, I want to give you some examples of stock phrases. I have just given you an example of a refrain. So let us uh, have some examples of the stock phrases that I mentioned. Uh, number one, you can find an expression like merry men, merry men, uh, milk white. I've noticed that whenever a ballad writer wants to say that something is uh, white, he would use milk white. If he wants to describe blonde hair, he would say yellow hair. And if he wants to describe something as very, very red, he would say blood red, blood red. Like the, uh, the example we had in introduction to literature when we studied uh, Sir Patrick Spins, the wine was described as blood red. Also a description of the night as gentle night, uh, bonnie bride, daughter dear, pretty babe. Notice the Scottish dialect, pretty babe, not baby like in the British dialect. It's pretty babe. So these are examples of, of stock phrases which are often employed in, in ballads. Uh, number E. There is no attempt at detail of time or place. The ballad belonging to a period when both could be ignored or left vague in the interest of the story. That is, if I want to put this thing uh, in a simple way, time and the place are not detailed. That is exactly like the exposition, which is not very, very clear. Also, time and place are not detailed. So the setting of the ballad is not often explained clearly because there is no need for that. Now, what are the types of ballads? I think um, here again, there is a similarity between the ballad and the epic. We have uh, two types, the ballad of growth, or what we call the authentic ballad, or if you like, uh, there is a third expression used in literature, which is the folk ballad, with unknown authorship, which means that the author is anonymous, all original or authentic ballads have anonymous authorship. Um, so the ballad is traditional and there is no need for the author. We call it also growth because it grew from one generation to, to another. So if you want to make sure that a ballad is um, uh, folk, authentic, or um, what we call uh, growth ballad. You know it if the author is anonymous or unknown. Then, uh, as time passed, there developed another form of the ballad known as ballad of art or art ballad, uh, in which we have um, a famous poet who wrote uh, a poem following all the rules of writing, of writing uh, a ballad. Uh, and the uh, literary ballad has uh, a well-known authorship. One great example could be the rhyme of the ancient mariner by the great romantic poet uh, uh, Coleridge. Coleridge wrote uh, an excellent example of of the literary ballad. Okay. I hope that it's crystal clear. And of course, you can always uh, seek uh, help and support if you need any questions or comments. Um, I think nothing can be clear without examples. So let us start by having an example on, uh, uh, on the ballad. And since the original type of the ballad is the um, 
folk ballad or the growth ballad I'm going to uh, have a look with you at the demon lover uh, an anonymous uh, ballad that best exemplifies the characteristics of the of the ballad okay are you ready as usual ballads start without any systematic introductions so let us read the ballad and sorry for the difficulty in uh, some expressions which can uh, be ascribed to Scottish uh, origins. Oh, where have you been, my long, long love? This long seven years and mere. Oh, I'm come to seek my former vows ye granted me before. Oh, hold your tongue of your former vows, for they will breed sad strife. Oh, hold your tongue of your former vows, for I am become a wife. He turned him right and round about, and the tear blinded his ee. I would never have trodden on Irish ground if it had not been for thee. I might have had a king's daughter far, far beyond the sea. I might have had a king's daughter had it not been for love of thee. If ye might have had a king's daughter, ye seal ye had to blame. You might have taken the king's daughter, for ye kinned that I was nane. If I was to leave my husband dear, and my two babes also, oh, what have you to take me to, if with you I should go? I had seven ships upon the sea, the eight brought me to land, with four and twenty bold mariners, and music on every hand. She has taken up her two little babes, kissed them both, cheek and chin. Oh, fair ye will, my own two babes, for I never see you again. She set her foot upon the ship, no mariners could she behold, but the sails were of the taftai, and the mast of the beating gold. She had not sailed a league, a league, but barely three, when Dismal grew his countenance, and Drumley grew his e. They had not sailed a league, a league, a league, but barely three, until she espied his cloven foot. And she wept right bitterly. Oh, hold your tongue of your weeping, says he. Of your weeping, now let me be. I will show you how the lilies grow on the banks of Italy. Oh, what hills are yon, yon pleasant hills that the sun shines sweetly on? Oh, yon are the hills of heaven, he said, where you will never win. Oh, what in a mountain is yon, she said, all so dreary with frost and snow. Oh, yon is the mountain of hell, he cried, where you and I will go. He struck the tap mast with his knee, the foremast with his knee, and broke the gallant ship in, in twain, and sank her in the sea. Oh my God. She had a tragic end, as you can imagine. This is our poem, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, page 102 and uh, 103. 102 and one or oh, three okay now let us try and explain the poem and what's going on with the with the poem let me go back to the beginning of of the of the ballad and try to discuss it with you 
If you have noticed, the demon lover is the title. And number two, we don't know the author. The author is anonymous. If you look at page 102, the writer started by, Oh, where have you been, my long, long love? This long seven years and more, I am come to seek my former vows he granted me uh, before. Uh, if you look at this part of the poem, you notice that there is a story behind this and it's not told to the readers uh, in details, but those who uh, heard the song um, definitely had an idea about it. If you read about the, uh, the ballad, it is often believed that it's a true story, a true love story about a young man who had uh, a beloved lady and after he had been away for seven years, he comes back to see her, but she had got married and uh, she ha now has um, two kids. The man recalled the memories of their love affair and their affection and pleaded her to come with him, leaving her husband and two, uh, and two children. And he reminds her of his vows or the vows that they had together. But this was of no use to her. So if you notice, uh, when we reach stanza three, we notice that uh, he reminds her that uh, he came back just for her and tells her that if it hadn't been for her, he wouldn't have uh, come to Ireland at all. Um, then the woman um, says to him that she cannot go with him right now and leave her kids because um, people would be talking about a woman who leaves her kids and joins her, her lover. So at the beginning, we notice that she rejects his offer and tells him that she will not uh, really come with him because it's a bad thing for a woman who is married and uh, who has kids to leave them and to join her, her lover. Then the lover says something which is really amazing. And it shows that uh, there is something that has changed in his, in his life. He tells her that he could have married, he could have married a, a, a princess. Oh God, who could marry a princess? Yes, I think only a rich person can marry a princess. But she tells him that if this were true, I think you would need to blame, to blame yourself and not to blame me because you know quite well that I am not a princess. You know that for a fact. I am not a princess. And this is repeated again in uh, the following stanza. And she says to him, how can I, how can I leave my kids and my husband and come, come with you? Obviously, all the appeal to their uh, uh, previous uh, love affair and to the promises that they had together did not really work, uh, did not really work with the woman. So what is to be done? I think the man should change his uh, process of of persuasion I think he needs to do, to do so all right now the man starts to speak in the language of of money he tells her that he uh, he has got um, Eight ships, eight ships. 
uh, of seven ships upon the sea, the eight brought me to land with four and twenty bold mariners and the music on every on every hand. So what do we have here? We have a very rich person who owns eight ships. Now, what is really amazing is the change of the woman's uh, argument after he mentioned uh, money. So, what did she do? She has taken up her two little babes, kissed them both, which is both in English, cheek and chin. Offer ye will my own two babes, for I'll never see you again. Notice here that uh, the writer is using chen, I think, in order to have rhyme with with again. So as, as we said before, sometimes you use a word which is not the most suitable one, but you use it in order to have to have rhyme. And you know, the, the ballad has a specific uh, rhyme scheme. It has a specific rhyme scheme. Okay. So there is a radical change here. The woman uh, changed from a woman who spoke of her family and her husband and her reputation. And she became obsessed with the fortune that, uh, that he gained uh, in his life. Now the woman takes an important step which is to leave her husband and her kids and to join to join her lover. Now the woman gets upon the ship, but she notices something strange. What is it? Well, he mentioned mariners, but when she uh, set her foot upon the ship, she could not see any any mariners she could not see any uh, mariners she also noticed something supernatural she noticed that the ship had sails which are made from the most expensive type of fabric you know the sail collects dust so the sail um, is expected to be of the cheapest uh, fiber. But what do we have here? We have expensive uh, uh, fabric. And the masts are made of gold, not cheap metals. They are made of, uh, of gold. She had not sailed a league, a league, a league, but barely three. Notice the use of Notice the use of uh, uh, the refrain here. Sailed a league, a league, but barely three. When dismally grew his countenance and drumly grew his ear. Uh, sorry, his E. Now she looked at his face and his facial expressions became gloomy. And uh, his eyes became dark. They had not sailed a league, a league, a league, but barely three until she spied his cloven foot. We said that uh, uh, the demon lover, of course, being a ballad, uh, thrives on the folklore of the nation. So if you look at uh, the picture that I have here, it shows you a cloven foot. It's very much like the hoof. It's like the hoof of, uh, of goats. The woman noticed something supernatural about her ex-lover. She noticed that he has got a cloven foot. And who usually has the cloven foot? Yes, guys, you have got it right. The devil. So, there is something abnormal here. Now, what's the reaction of the woman? The woman started crying immediately. But now, 
um, her lover tells her that he doesn't want to hear her. He doesn't want uh, her to weep. And he tells her that he will show her how the lilies grow on the banks, on the banks of Italy. Okay, now what's going to happen to the woman? Then he tells her, okay, let's go. She saw some hills and she asked him about these beautiful hills. And he tells her that these are the hills of heaven where she will never will never win oh my god so the woman must have been afraid he tells her that she will never go to to heaven and then she saw mountains and they were dreary with the frost and the snow and he tells her that they will go there How can they uh, go to hell or heaven? Yes, of course, they need, they need to die. Otherwise, how could someone go to hell or heaven without a death? Okay. So he uh, uh, struck the top mast of the ship with his hand and the foremast of the ship with his knee and broke the beautiful ship into two. Gallant ship. Notice this is a... a, a a stocky phrase, a gallant ship, in it went and sank here in the in the sea, and this was the end, the end of our uh, lady, who has been described in our uh, folk folk ballad. So what's up with the woman and what's up with the man here? I think this is part of the uh, of the folklore of the nation that produced this kind of of ballad. And it's no wonder that our ballad appeared in one of the broadsides of the 16th uh, century, which carried the title of um, uh, A Warning for Married Women. It's a collection of ballads entitled A Warning for ba uh, Married Women. Uh, and it is often believed that our ballad uh, describes the story of a woman whose name was Jane Reynolds, a West Country woman, who uh, gave her uh, oath to a seaman, to be his wife, that is, and she was afterwards married to a carpenter, and uh, at last uh, she was carried away by, by a spirit. So that's why we have the title, The Demon, Lover, the woman was carried away uh, by a spirit. Um, so it, obviously, this is a warning for married women not to leave their kids and their husbands for their ex uh, lovers. Um, actually, this is uh, a ballad that embodies the folklore of the culture that produced produced it. So you will have some uh, issues like. Um, uh, has she earned her fate or um, why uh, was she punished like this etc okay i i think we have a lot of questions to uh, contemplate but i hope that i was able to make you feel the spirit of the of the ballad as a literary uh, type uh, so here we come to the to the end of our lecture about about the ballad thank you very much for being with me see you next time with a new topic which is going to be subjective poetry and the first type of subjective poetry is going to be the the lyric thank you bye